this week we're embarking on our longest voyage ever on our own. First hopping from Solomon's Island to Norfolk, Virginia, then on to Charleston, South Carolina, and finally on to Port Lauderdale, Florida. We're doing two to three day passages to avoid the large storm systems with 50 knot winds moving along the coast. It should have been relatively easy, but an issue with our steering system resulted in 35 hours at the wheel. It's times like these that you see what you're really made of. I'm Kristen, this is Fabio, and this is our dog Yoda. We sold our home last year and moved aboard our Seawind 1600 Catamaran Wanderlust. Over the past year, we've sailed the waters of South Florida, the Keys, and the Bahamas, shaking down our new boat. We're now setting off on our journey to harbors unknown exploring the world and connecting with people and places through the local cuisine. Subscribe now to join our voyage. November 1st, the date when our insurance allows us to move south of the Florida-Georgia line is just a few days away. We left Solomon's Island this morning and are making our way south through the Chesapeake to Norfolk, Virginia, where we'll wait for a weather window to sail down to Charleston, South Carolina. Norfolk is home to the largest naval base in the world, along with NATO's Strategic Command Headquarters and Maersk Line, which manages the world's largest fleet of U.S. flag vessels. We knew there would be many large vessels to contend with, so we paid close attention as we turned up the Elizabeth River headed for the Norfolk Yacht Club on the Lafayette River where we'd wait for our weather window. We're in Norfolk, Virginia, and we've been here for about three days waiting for our weather window to head down to Charleston, South Carolina. And looks like tomorrow, Monday, November 1st, is the day that we're going to be heading down. Um, we So we figured right now would be a good time to share with you guys how we do our weather routing and make our decision for when is the best time to leave for us. We use predict wind to do the weather routing and then we're able to import that into our B&G. Charleston is right about here. So we put the cursor there, then predict wind and route to cursor. We've got our start time Monday, November 1st, 7 a.m. Light wind motoring is on. Polar speed adjustment we have set to 88% because we know it won't be 100% of our polars. And then we say download. So now we find our route. This is our route here. Show the route. We use the predict wind routes as kind of a guide. And if we look and we see that anything is kind of too close to shore, we need to alter it a bit we do that and so right here the route is a bit too close to shore for our taste so i'm just going to edit the route so here i go to the route edit move and i'm going to move this waypoint and finish moving. And now, of course, I have to move this one as well. That looks better. And then we can come closer to land or stay out actually probably would be better because here we have to shoot kind of neck for this next little lighthouse here. So we won't move them all now, but we will be doing it for our passage. And again, this is a guide. The other thing we need to keep in mind is the position of the Gulf Stream because sometimes it comes really close to shore, even as close as Cape Hatteras Light. And predict wind, there is an ocean data tool 
And so we pulled that up and this is our route here. And you can see this is the Gulf Stream moving north and we definitely don't want to be in that. That's why Predict Wind is putting us so close to land, but we've got some wiggle room there. So we're good to go in terms of where the Gulf Stream is flowing. Then we go to the weather routing tool. We can actually see how long it's going to take us to get there. It's a 396 nautical miles, leaving Monday at seven. Press play and you can see the little boat. Kind of, you can see your route and what the wind will be. Looks like we're gonna have a beautiful downwind sail. And we wanted to have light wind going around Hatteras. We don't mind motoring if we have to, but it looks like we're still gonna have enough wind to sail with the spinnaker. It looks like we'll arrive in Charleston Wednesday around 12.30. If you're enjoying this video, give it a thumbs up and leave us a comment down below. We love to hear from you guys. If you really want to help us out, be sure to subscribe to our channel. People are often surprised when we tell them it's only the two of us running a 52-foot catamaran with a 26-foot beam. We are definitely still refining our communication, but when we're maneuvering off a dock, we're both focused on the task and really trying to work together. Plus, Fabio has become quite adept at pivoting off of one line, and I'm the eyes for everything he can't easily see. Since the weather turned cold, we were quite excited to be heading south, and we're fortunate to have such a beautiful sunrise send off. We set out from Norfolk around seven o'clock this morning and we motored because we were up in one of the rivers off of the Chesapeake. We motored past the port and past the Navy station, the Navy base. And once we finally got out into the Atlantic, we saw that we had like 12, 13 knots of wind coming from just off our stern. So we pulled up the main, we pulled up the spinnaker and then the wind died. So we had like seven and a half, eight knots of wind, which really kind of wasn't enough to keep the spinnaker filled. And plus we were going like 3.94 knots and 
that's just too slow for this passage. We really just are kind of on passage. It's more like a delivery. We douse the spinnaker. We still have up the main, but we're motor sailing and we're making eight and a half knots. It's a beautiful day. Sun's out, not too cold. We were gonna try and head out a little bit because it looked like it looks like what happened is the wind shifted offshore more. So we were going to head out east to try and find the wind, but it just looks like the wind is too far offshore and it doesn't make sense. So for now, we will just kind of head towards Hatteras and be thankful that we've got calm seas, sunny skies, all in all good weather for rounding Cape Hatteras. Hopefully in the next day or so, we'll pick up some wind. We soon pulled out the jib as well to maximize our speed. It is now five o'clock on day one, and the trip has been great so far, really easy. Uh, the wind changed at around, I guess, one o'clock and swung around and started coming out of north, northeast at anywhere really from eight to 12 knots. Um, <clears throat> so Fabio pulled out the screecher. We still have on the engine because we just want to get around Cape Hatteras as quickly as possible. Looks like we're about five or six hours away from Hatteras, so we'll round that tonight around midnight, but it should be totally fine because the seas are still pretty flat and we're making great time. With sunset approaching, Fabio laid out the jack lines so we could tether ourselves if we needed to go up on deck during the night. We don't come up here that often when we're underway, but it's really beautiful. Especially now with the sun setting. The sky is kind of pastel. Everything's pastel. Moments like these are really quite special and we love to share them with you guys in hopes that you can get a little bit of an idea of what it's like out here, away from the constant notifications and obligations of everyday life. As darkness enveloped the boat, we settled into our shifts, rotating every four hours or so. and we've gone 227 miles. We've averaged eight knots 
and the highest speed was 12.9 knots. Right now we only have about six knots of wind, so we're motoring. We don't have any sails up. Fabio had the screecher up a little bit earlier, but it was just flogging, so he took it down. We've fallen into a rhythm now where we're doing shifts, about four and a half hour shifts. We stayed up together for about an hour this morning, had some breakfast. But other than that, just kind of try and get as much rest as we can. It's so awesome that the temperatures have gotten warmer. It's, the effects of the Gulf Stream are just incredible. That warm body of water just really raises the, the air temperature. And it just makes for a much more enjoyable trip, obviously. Yoda is here with me. Say hi, Beanie. <laughs> Bon appetit. Bon appetit. <laughs> what do we have here? The chicken thighs that are cooked sous vide with uh, some curry powder and garlic and and uh, this is the, uh, the the new creation. I know. The cabbage cake, the substitute for a crab cake with a crab. And uh, you know, same ingredients. It's like the inside of an egg roll. Exactly. It's like a healthy egg roll, basically. Exactly. Mm. Delish. You bet we can have wine on a passage. I know. That sucks. <laughs> right. Really? It's good for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apparently. <laughs> Listening to the Freakonomics podcast with Stephen Dubner. It's actually really interesting because he was, during the pandemic, um, there was this economist, I forget his name right now, but he was sitting at home and he was watching CNN, you know, trying to be informed about the latest news of COVID and what was being done on the vaccines. And all he heard was negative news. And he was like, Am I going crazy? Like, is the news really just negative? And so he ended up conducting a study with another economist and a foundation and to see if the national American major news outlets are in fact predominantly negative and if they're more negative than um, international news outlets, local news media, and scientific journals. And what they found was that the American major U.S. news outlets are negative 87% of the time. The scientific journals are negative 64% of the time. And then the international news was 51% of the time and local news 53% of the time. So out of all of this news, we're really not hearing, say, like the 37%. Is that what it is? I think, of uh, positive scientific news, Yes. right? They're, they're never reported. So we don't hear that. That's very interesting. And so he was wondering if it's because, you know, like chicken or egg, right? Like, is it the American news outlets that are creating this negativity and then people watch it and then crave more or is it that people actually are more attracted to 
negativity. Yeah. And it kind of like you've heard the um, the saying, if it leads, it leads. Right. And that really goes back to this um, negativity bias that humans, that people have innately, right? right. And you were saying it goes back to this fight or flight right. mentality. Like it saves your life, right? You better be told to tune to negative events because they will, you know, just step onto a snake or kill you. Right. But rather than the positive events, if you step into a rosemary flower, you know, and it a nice flower. Right. It doesn't smell good, but, you know, we're more biased when we put nice negative events in danger. Right. And to react more viscerally to. Neg- negative language and even what's interesting they talked about is that the English language has more specific words for negative things or um, bad emotions right yeah. like um, shame and anger and grief and uh, remorse but for positive emotions it's like happy joy <laughs> excited like there's just a few of them and so i think it still goes back to this negativity bias and it's interesting how it also applies to you oh yeah absolutely i mean they were saying so now of course we have over the past you know whatever it is now 15 years 20 years that we've had social media you can actually see very easily that people do, there is much more engagement on negative news. In fact, they did a, another study where they were looking at social media from uh, political news outlets and politicians themselves. And whenever there was a mention of the out group, which is the opposing party the, or the competitor in like a negative way, there was a much higher incidence, much higher engagement of comments and uh, sharing of that content. So now with Facebook and YouTube and Instagram, they're media companies, right? right? They're selling advertising. So whatever gets the most engagement is the content yes, that the wins. Right, yes, the point the mm-hmm. So that's probably why some, some, of the, some of the titles there are like, oh my God, you know, I sunk my boat or... Exactly. Like, even if there's not necessarily something negative throughout the video, if one small bad thing happened, people are titling it like what's that smell oh the dirty toilet or um i don't remember any others off the top of my head right now but i remember that one sticks out it's of course the hook it's the drama yeah of course and look at movies on tv yeah same thing you know it's the same thing but you know we talk about with our channel you know small channel we want to share our experiences and focus on the positive yeah and so there's not a lot of drama there's you know, I feel like I'm trying to, we're trying to create stories that have, that are interesting. Yeah, no, we try to avoid them when it's possible, yeah. Yep. So, it's nice, right? The weather on day three definitely took a turn and we were seeing the effects from the front that was predicted to come in behind us. Fortunately, in just a few hours, we'd be at the Charleston Inlet.
There were a number of large vessels and tugboats entering the channel with us, so we monitored the radio closely and paid close attention to the movements of the traffic around us. Once we cleared the other boats, we pulled in the sails since we weren't sure how much room we'd have once inside the harbor. We finally realized there is a huge dredging project in the Charleston Harbor. The harbor is being deepened from 47 feet to 52 feet, enabling post Panamax vessels to enter the port of Charleston at any time. This will make it the deepest harbor on the East Coast and further connect South Carolina to global markets. Upon arrival, we learned the front was quickly approaching and 50 knot winds were forecast for tomorrow and would last a couple days. Both marinas were full when we called initially, but we were fortunate to get a spot last minute at the Charleston Harbor Resort and Marina. Each morning, the birds outside our window performed a beautiful dance, which I learned is a murmuration. Hundreds, even thousands of starlings fly together in a whirling, intricately coordinated, yet ever-changing pattern. It's not known why or even how they do this, but it is absolutely mesmerizing. Soon enough, the winds picked up and the rain began, so we settled in and got some work done. Fabio checked the weather regularly to see when we could leave for Fort Lauderdale. It looked like on Monday, November 8th, the weather would be favorable for our 419 nautical mile journey south, and we were certainly ready for some warmth and sunshine. There are a few different weather models, so we compared them all, checking the wind speed, direction, angle, wave height, and direction, along with the proximity of the Gulf Stream to the coast and our planned course. The storm has passed. We're going to go tomorrow. Are you free? I'm free. Talk to me. Though we were disappointed we didn't get to explore Charleston, we were so ready to be in a warmer climate.
of our passage from Charleston to Fort Lauderdale and I woke up this morning about 6.30 and Fabio was hand steering. The autopilot isn't working again. The saga with the autopilot continues. So we are just south of Jacksonville, Florida on the Palm Coast. So we have about 25 hours left to get to Fort Lauderdale. We have the screecher out and the engines on just because we want to get there as quickly as possible. It's forecast to rain today and looks like rain in the distance. <laughs> so we've got our day cut out for us, but that's boat life. Out here, we're challenged in different ways. And before this passage, I always struggled with night watch, but with no autopilot, we had decided to do two hour shifts. Understanding the pressure Fabio felt it was no problem at all to pull my weight and help shoulder the responsibility of arriving at our destination safely. And the universe rewarded me with spectacular shooting stars, like flares streaking across the sky and dolphins leaping out of the water playing at our bow. Being on passage in the open ocean without the distractions of modern day life, no internet, no cell service, gives you the space and time to just be. To be in the present moment, watching the wind in the sails, the cargo ships pass by in the distance, observing changes in the water as it turns different shades of blue, sunlight glinting on its crests, delighting in the different creatures found on board, watching the sun set and offering gratitude for another magical day spent on the ocean. As the hues transition from from golden to pastel. Soon enough, we recognized the Fort Lauderdale coastline and knew we had made it. I was so proud of us for working together and taking care of each other and knew we were truly ready for the full adventure ahead. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.